Well, hey, everybody. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to another IRIS webinar. Um, this is Andy Frasetto from the IRIS headquarters office in Washington, D.C. For the uninitiated, the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology is about a 30-year-old uh, nonprofit consortium of universities. It's also a science facility funded by uh, the National Science Foundation to operate programs that enable a broad spectrum of geophysical research. Um, and if you don't know me personally, I'm uh, basically a quote unquote Swiss Army Knife uh, project associate helping to manage the Earthscope US Array, the Global Seismic Network, and uh, a number of other programs that are operated out of IRIS. And uh, one of those programs is the webinar series. So uh, if you have any ideas for potential speakers or topics that we haven't covered, uh, please let me know. And um, on the on the subject of the webinar series, uh, I would refer everyone to our website if you haven't been here before. It's uh, iris.edu slash hq slash webinar, and you can go through and access uh, all the previous uh, webinars that have been recorded. Uh, just click on the thumbnail and it'll take it to the YouTube page where it's been archived. In addition to that, there's the uh, upcoming schedule of speakers. And as, as I was telling Elmer uh, before we uh, started up, this will wane a little bit over the summer. So there's uh, four more, including this one today, and then probably only a handful, one or two, uh, between June and September. So uh, of course, you can always go back on here and look for the repeats. Just to outline how this process works, uh, there's just me and Elmer who are going to be uh, unmuted. If you have a question that you'd like to ask, what you should do is uh, clearly and concisely type it into the box that says uh, questions on the control panel that's on floating on your screen. And what I'll do is at the end, I will read your name uh, and the question to Elmer. And so he will uh, go through one by one as I dictate them and uh, respond to those. Both the presentation and the questions are recorded and they're gonna be archived as I demonstrated through the website. So uh, if you have to leave or you know somebody else who you think would be really interested in seeing this, this is available uh, in perpetuity after today. So you can always go back and check out something that you might've missed. Uh, if the webinar has a technical glitch and blows up, this has only happened once, but it did happen. Uh, just give it a moment and then click on the link that you have with the uh, registration and it should. I'll be able to get it started back up and then you can come back in it like, uh, like nothing happened. And uh, just as sort of my personal curiosity, I know that there are people out there who watch this uh, on a big screen in their lab room with a group of people. If you're there with a group, it would be great to know uh, approximately how many of you in addition are watching. Just good, it's good metric to keep track of for our um, stats. So I think without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker, who is uh, Dr. Elmer Riegrock. He's a postdoc at Delft Technical University in the Netherlands. Elmer received his master's and PhD uh, from Delft as well. And in fact, he's our first speaker broadcasting as part of a webinar from outside the US. So I think it's about 830 in the Netherlands. So hopefully we don't keep Elmer up too late with questions. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna switch it over to Elmer and uh, he'll present his talk on body wave interferometry, data mining from distant seismicity. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change presenter mode and Elmer, your audio will pick up uh, in just a second. All right, you should be unmuted, Elmer. All right. Great. Okay. All right. Hello, everybody. Also, a welcome here. A welcome from Delft in the, in the Netherlands, where I still am after all those years. Onto next year. Uh, onto next year, in fact, next April. And in fact, it would be quite interesting to find out also where uh, you all are. So I would say just type it in and send to Andrew. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank both Andrew and Fira for giving me the opportunity to give this talk. Me, myself, I took quite some advantage of Irish, especially of the great data facilities, but I also learned a lot from those webinars. So I hope with this webinar I can give something back to the community. 
I hope it will give some inspiration. The topic I will be talking about is outlined here, it's seismic interferometry. Uh, most people apply this uh, to surface waves, but I will show that it can perfectly be applied to body waves as well. In principle, seismic interferometry can be seen as a fluttering operation that makes uh, earthquake responses or more general seismic responses more amenable for seismic imaging. Uh, I will show how this body wave seismic interferometry, interferometry works, uh, so a bit of the theory, and then I soon will we'll go to real data examples where it has been applied to measurements uh, at different places in the world. And then each time I will show how it could be applied or how it is already being applied to US array data. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Up front, I'd like to thank my collaborators in the different projects which are listed here. Also, I'd like to thank uh, my sponsors during my PhD, that was the Dutch Research Foundation, NWL, and the current sponsor of my postdoc, which is the Dutch Solid Earth Research Fund, called ISIS. And also, I'd like to thank all those data providers, which for this presentation are Shell, Irish, and Orpheus. Well, in, in this faculty, what we mostly do is reflection imaging, and <coughs> we can see that, especially for the upper part of the Earth, that's still the geophysical or the seismic method of choice to get a high-resolution image of the subsurface. Uh, it only works, though, when you have a nicely well-sampled array of receivers on the Earth's surface, also, in fact, an array of sources, and now for any of one of those sources, uh, when you induce then a seismic wave field and measure the reflections at the different receivers, the reflections from the different lithological contrasts, uh, then you can afterwards, through a migration step, find out where those reflections occurred, and therewith creates such kind of high resolution reflectivity image of the subsurface. This is uh, the, the original outline of the transportable US array, where you see it's moving from the west to the, to the east coast. It's, uh, it's a pretty impressive array, and it's well, almost, almost done now, actually. And you see, in fact, it has, has a great distribution to do three-dimensional reflection imaging. Uh, the station spacing is a bit wide, wide though, so it's it would not be too suitable for cross imaging, but for mental imaging, it would be perfect. If you would like to use control sources to uh, to uh, induce wave fields that reach all the way to the mental, then we would need to use use extremely large source sources, which are both very destructive and expensive. So that's simply simply something that's not really happening. As an alternative, we can then look to using uh, natural sources to find uh, the station or to find the source distribution re required for reflection imaging. Uh, if you look to the to the earthquake distribution, then you see here in the western United States there was quite some earthquakes, but they are irregularly distributed. And disadvantages of using earthquakes directly is that they uh, that they induce P and S waves simultaneously. And then another thing is that sometimes you really need to wait years or months or even more decades to find some earthquakes at the desirable locations. Another major source of seismic energy is the uh, microseism, specifically the double frequency microseism that occurs when uh, ocean swell interacts to form a standing wave, which then couples to the solid earth. And this coupling is especially strong where the ocean reaches such a depth, uh, <coughs> reaches a specific depth, then you get a, a large coupling constant, and that happens at quite some places around America, around northern America. But yeah, then you've got sources 
they're out on the ocean and not really inside the continents, what would be most desirable for reflection imaging. Other thing is, of course, that it, uh, the, those are very noisy sources and hard to uh, treat treat with in a normal imaging scheme. So, <laughs> uh, so I then come up with uh, seismic interferometry, which is then a possible uh, uh, possible method that can be applied to slightly alleviate this lack of sources uh, in the USA. I see this technique to construct virtual sources at receiver locations. How that works, or how that could work, is sketched here. Where we have two stations, one at XA and one at XB, measuring both seismicity from the same sources at the other side of the globe. And now by applying seismic informatory, we can retrieve the response as if one of the, those stations was a seismic source, and you then measure this reflection at XB. So this kind of filtering operation <laughs> it can be applied on a global scale, like we sketched. It can also be applied to retrieve reflection from lithospheric interfaces. In that case, also you would use distant seismicity and process that further with seismic interferometry to obtain this kind of reflection response. And finally, you could also use local or regional seismicity to, in the end, find reflection responses of the basin or just, more in general, the, the upper part of the crust. So I said before, this use array has really an excellent distribution of stations. And then applying uh, seismic interferometry, potentially, you can, for each one of the stations that was simultaneously active, you can create at one of those stations a virtual source and measure the reflections. You can do that for each of the stations, and you can do the same for the next batch of uh, stations that was, was simultaneously active. So in the end, <laughs> uh, if this is all really being done, you have a large collection of so-called shot gas or virtual source gas. And if you apply the seismic reflection imaging, you would really be able to watch into the continent and see what kind of uh, interfaces there are here, and in the end, finding out precisely the lithology in depth. So how, well, how to do that? So first, treat uh, the basics of seismic interferometry. Afterwards, we have a look at uh, applications uh, to find lithospheric scale reflections. After, then we look to global scale reflections and the conclusions. So to start with the basics, um, a very simple example, or simplistic example, where we have uh, the Earth's surface, this black line, we have two receivers placed upon it. Again, those positions are called XA and XB. In the subsurface, we have one reflector, and we have a whole array of sources, which are the, the blue dots. Now, this direct wave induced by the source at X, mentioned at XA, we call capital X. And besides that, we consider a so-called gross reflection, measured at XB, uh, due to the same source at X. Now, when we cross-collate the response at XA with XB, then what we obtain is a <coughs> pulse, which arrives at the time difference of this direct wave and the gross reflection. And here it, it stands a convolution. Convolution with a time reverse response becomes a correlation. Uh, this uh, the same correlation we can do for another source, where now the direct wave and ghost reflection are overlapping. Then you see the uh, <coughs> the cross-correlated pulse arise at a slightly later time. If you do it again for more uh, a deeper source, then you see that the paths do not overlap anymore, and the time difference becomes a bit smaller again. Now, when we do that for all the sources in the subsurface, 
you see that after cross correlation, you get this correlation event, which has a clear maximum. And this maximum occurs precisely there, where this direct wave and the ghost reflection are overlapping. Now, when you <coughs> stack all this energy or those amplitudes, when you stack that over source position, then the only energy that stacks in is the energy in this area, the so-called stationary phase area, where the derivative of this event with, with respect to the source position becomes zero. That area, uh, the amplitude stack in, and all the other energy here disappears. It interferes uh, destructively. You see that here. And now you can prove that the pulse we have here that that is in fact the response, or, or the reflection in this case, as if there was a source in XA and a receiver in XB. Besides, we have this small artifact here, which is due to the edge of the, of the summation. Well, in reality, you don't only measure a direct pulse at XA and a gross reflection at XB but you, you measure all kinds of events, which we have drawn only a few. <laughs> so in reality, you could measure a whole response, a Green's function, or a Green's function, then even conforms with a source time function. Now, if you include more of those events and then repeat the cross-correlation, then this time we don't get only one correlation event, but we get, in this case, four, one, two, very small one and four. And when we stack over those cross correlations, then we obtain both contributions contributions at positive times and at negative times. And well, you can you can prove that the contributions at positive times that in this case they are the a uh, direct wave, as if there was a source in XA and receiving in XB, and also the reflection. And at negative time, the similar response obtained, but only the source and receive are switch, switching position, and there is a, a minus sign. So this is what we have, uh, what have shown so far numerically, that this holds. In fact, you still need to apply the derivative with respect to time to the to the stacked uh, cost correlations. You can <coughs> really derive this formally, and then you end up with with this integral equation, which holds for not not only one interface in the subsurface, but uh, arbitrarily heterogeneous subsurfaces, as long as you have this whole array of uh, sources to integrate over. So when you implement this equation, you need to take in mind that in reality it's an integral equation, which needs to be approximated well with a summation, with a summation over point sources. So in case there are many point sources in the subsurface like here, then the retrieved response, which is this black line, is identical to the directly modeled response, which is the direct modeling of those units, which is the the red line. However, if you reduce the amount of point sources, then you see already that you get tiny artifacts here, because some energy here is not interfering destructively anymore. And when you further re reduce the amount of sources, you get stronger artifacts. So you always need to take in mind that they have sufficient uh, source centering. Then another point to, to watch is that, in fact, uh, well, you only need illum illumination from one side. If you include only all those sources, or for some reason only had all those sources, then we would only sample those correlation events here, or the stationary event for this direct wave here and for the reflection here. So it would only uh, result in retrieving this Green's function at positive times. And when we had uh, 
we had illumination from the other direction, we would retrieve the green function at negative times. In reality, you can play with this and combine illumination from both directions to, in the end, uh, increase uh, the effect of sampling. Other things to take in mind is that <laughs> that's, uh, well, when you have only sources near the Earth's surface, then the only thing you can retrieve in this case is the direct values. And you get small artifacts due to the edges, due to the edge of the source distribution. And when you have source in the subsurface, then you perfectly retrieve this reflection between X A and X B, but not at all the direct wave. And the direct wave or the cross correlation of the direct wave, they only give edge effects which you would need to remove. So, how can this theory be applied to obtain lithospheric scale reflections? This we consider an array of receivers they are placed on the Earth's surface, which is illuminated by a, an earthquake very far away. And we consider this direct P phase going all the way here. Now, if you zoom in, to this area of interest, or to the area where we would like to image the lithosphere, then you can see that this incoming waveform, and this scale looks more or less like a, a planar waveform, and both the direct wave, as all kinds of crustal and upper mantle reverberations are recorded. Now, if you measure uh, such kind of phase responses from many different earthquakes, then with seismic interferometry, you can filter from those direct waves and reverberations. You can filter the response as if one of those stations was a virtual source, and you match it the reflections at the other stations. The theory for this, in fact, we have we have seen that well, if you have a good distribution of point sources in the subsurface, then by cross correlation correlation of observations, you can get a virtual source here. It's now when we look to the lithospheric scale configuration, so we've got a whole array of receivers, of which now we only look to two of those. Then <coughs> what we've seen, the direct wave, or the, the p-phase, due to a source at a t seismic distance, it can be seen, in fact, as a plane wave or in the end it can be described as a plane wave source being located just below the lithosphere of interest. And this plane wave source then can be described with a certain ray parameter, or in, in fact the angle of incidence. Then the same earthquake leads also to different phases, like the PCP and the PP phase, which lead to effective plane waves below the lithosphere of interest with different angles of incidence, so different rate parameters. And when we now look to another earthquake, it leads to different different phases and then different plane waves with different angles of incidence arriving in the area. So it's sampling a different part of this rate parameter distribution. So for this kind of application, it makes more sense to rewrite this uh, integral of uh, point sources to integral of uh, uh, plane wave sources, which we have done here. So now the integration is over P, of a wave parameter. And then by evaluating this integral, you can still retrieve the desired Green's functions. We tested this on using data from uh, Laramie, which is, um, or from the Laramie Array, which was near the place of Laramie in Wyoming, United States. This is the receiver configuration here. It's quite a good sampling of stations, more or less in line with the ring of fire. And for that reason, we could select many earthquakes that were more or less in line with the array. From all those earthquakes, uh, from the ones with good quality data, we select a different phase arrivals. For instance, for this earthquake, we select them 
uh, the, the P phase arriving with all the uh, reverberations included. And also separately we extract the PP phase and all reverberations. After doing that for all the earthquakes in the data set, we had a distribution of I think like 60 or 70 phase responses. And here they are uh, shown as a function of ray parameter. And you see for some ray parameters you have many phase responses and for other ray parameters you don't. So in the end you have a very irregular distribution or in the end you get irregular uh, <coughs> uh, in the end the integral which you like to approximate this one this one here is very irregularly sampled. Another possible issue we have is that there are not only reverberations in those responses at the, at the receiver side, but also at the source side, there are interactions with the, with the lithosphere. So for this reason, we first tested whether it works on synthetic data. We generate synthetic data with this irregular distribution and with those source sites with impressions. We did that for a very simple model with two interfaces in the crust, a Moho here and one reflector in the upper mantle. For this model, this is the directly modeled reflection response. And now we estimated it it's using seismic informality with all those transmission responses which are which have a very irregular distribution. You see that well for sure it's not perfect. You get all those uh, side effects due to the irregularity. But still the reflections are quite clear. And if you then also include the source side reflections then well, things get worse. Uh, but still, mm -hmm. these kind of uh, estimations of reflection responses, if you use them in the imaging scheme, mm -hmm. what we did, so we used it for migration scheme, and still you can see that you can find a really accurate image of the two interfaces here in the crust, now only of the deeper reflectors, not really, because we didn't uh, remove the multiples. So we, we went on and applied this uh, to real data. And then the effects you can retrieve, those kind of uh, reflection responses as if there was a source at one of those stations of the Laramie array. And you can do that for all different stations. So the, the question is then, can you apply similar processing to US ray data? Uh, if you look to the current state of the use ray, uh, most importantly here the, the red stations, they depict the current locations of the transport wall array. The distance between those stations is quite large and to retrieve a lithospheric or a crustal reflection between those distant receivers, you need to have incoming ray fronts with with high rate parameters or high angles of incidence. And those are only provided by regional or local seismicity. And we see that in the United States there there is not a sufficient amount of those. So so this kind of processing it cannot really be applied to the transportable array. However, there are those flexible arrays with a much denser station sampling especially the ones which are in line with the ring of fire, there the same kind of reflections could be retrieved between different stations. <coughs> Still, for the other stations there is an alternative. Let's do retrieve reflections only between one and the same position. So as if there was a virtual source and receiver at the same position. And how that works will show in the coming few slides. So for this application, we only use uh, global phases. Global phases are phases for which, which the ways has to first the Earth's core before reaching the array. So for instance, Bakai IKP. <coughs> if you look then near the array, you see that the wavefront due to such phase 
it's again almost planar and arise with really small angles of incidence. And only a few of those waveforms, if they have, if they would look like a delta pulse wave, then a few of those waveforms would suffice to estimate the reflection response <coughs> as if there was a source and receiver at the place of the of the receiver. They would depend on reflections of horizontal and ordinarily horizontal interfaces. <coughs> Well, the problem in, in reality is that earthquakes don't look like perfect uh, delta pulses. So earthquakes could be quite complicated. They could be uh, written even as a whole succession of smaller earthquakes. So we don't get a clear, effective uh, plane wave pulse here, but we have a whole succession of pulses. Moreover, we have again those source time configurations. So what are waves traveling down first at the source side and not until then up towards the receivers. So this wave train here becomes even more complicated. Uh, other issues for specifically for global faces is that there are multiple stationary ray bars that arrive almost simultaneously here at the receiver. So by those kind of uh, triplications, you can get even a doubling of such wave train, making things even more complicated. Luckily, uh, all those all those uh, uh, complications they vary as function of source position. While the receiver side structure, of course, does not vary uh, as function of source position, especially when they are being illuminated by almost the same. Uh, angle of incidence. So for that reason, as long as you use many earthquake responses, then still you can make a good estimates of this uh, receiver side structure. We will show that with data from the high climb array, which was a really nice array, nice data from <laughs> a station distribution over the Tibet. We used for this global phases induced by earthquakes, especially in the Andes region, and some here at the Pacific and, and uh, South Atlantic. Then <laughs> this is right away the result after autocorrelating one such uh, one such tra transmission response or one such global phase response. Uh, it shows the uh, result at positive times as function of station location, about 60 stations. So, in fact, here you cannot see anything really. To this, we add the autocorrelation of the second phase, of the third phase, of the fourth phase, of the fourth earthquake, fifth phase, etc. By stacking in all those phase responses or autocorrelations of phase responses. You see that more and more of the artifacts uh, which are due to those, for instance, small size with vibrations, they disappear, and more and more of the receiver side structure lights up. Then to this crude estimation of the reflection response, we still need to uh, make it amenable to, to put it in a migration algorithm. So we need to remove the artifacts around zero time. We need to suppress the multiples and regularize the data. Then it's being put in a migration algorithm, giving the upper image of the subsurface then below a part of uh, Tibet. So on this image, you can really clearly see the maho and all the structure in it. And you see all kinds of structure here in the crust. This image is compared, this reflectivity image is compared with a convertibility image. So that's the image that's obtained by applying the receiver function methods. Where you can also see the maho clearly, but you see some less structure in the in the crust. So could you do the same for user ray data? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, we plotted the for one station in the middle of the USA, we plotted the range in which 
uh, seismicity leads the global basis arrive near. Now the blue dots are seismicity, larger than magnitude 6. And you see there's quite a bunch here, the mid oceanic bridges in the Indian Ocean. There's also seismicity here near Sumatra and Java. So it's quite likely that you can apply the same processing estimators to offset the reflection responses between each station of the user array. And then you can find a very detailed image of the mental transition zone. Okay, so, so far we discussed earthquake applications. I want to show shortly that similar processing can be applied to micro or micro responses that we'll do with data recorded uh, recorded here in the Ankaranik Basin in Egypt, so just below the southeastern Mediterranean, close to the, the Nile Delta. We are. Uh, this is the distribution of stations or the, or the different uh, squares. For one subarray, so for one line of stations here, this is 100 seconds of recording, where you can see that this recording is pretty much <coughs> dominated by these typical periods in the double frequency micro -sizing. And you see that the although it's of course very noisy, it's very consistent of the array in this noise. The same you see when you plot the power spectrum densities. For different stations, you see the low frequencies, everything is very consistent. You clearly see a peak at a single frequency micro -sizing. You see another peak there at a double frequency micro -sizing. and here it's special we see a third small peak <laughs> which which is related to uh, ocean wave interaction not in a big ocean but in a smaller sea like the Mediterranean which gives rise to uh, a higher frequency micro -sizing. We further, further analyze this band and with beam forming we found out that indeed almost all the energy in this band is from the northwest and if we then look to the distribution of ray parameters estimated by beam forming, we find that those ray parameters cannot not be explained by surface rays. <coughs> but uh, all those ray parameters are in the range of body waves. And there is a nice large distribution of ray parameters, which means that we can really apply seismic interferometry. Or body wave seismic interferometry. So we select this subarray, which is more or less in line with the dominant illumination. Then we apply seismic interferometry and find one large reflection, which is consistent over the array. Then the kind of virtual source scatters we obtained, we resource to to a thing that's called a common midpoint gather, where each source receiver combination is now looking to the same, same area in the subsurface. And this kind of, uh, with this kind of common midpoint gather, we can use a hyperbolic description of this reflection to find out average velocities of the subsurface above this reflection, which is in this case turns out to be around. 3.2 kilometers per second, and then we can use this velocity to map this reflection to its correct depth, which is in this case around 5 kilometers depth. And we compare this with uh, the information what's known from the area, and it turns out it precisely coincides where one expects to be the, the interface between the sedimentary basin here and the crystalline rock uh, below. Okay, brings us to the 
final topic that's to apply similar things but then on a global scale. So to, to look to reflectors which are below the lithosphere. If you want to apply it on a global scale, then you actually need to take into account that you need to take into account that uh, the Earth is a, a closed entity. So if you put in seismic energy uh, and if you don't assume any losses, it will be bouncing up and down for a very long time. <coughs> in the derivation, we took this into account and then it, it turns out you don't, you should not cross correlate full responses, but, but you should cross correlate the <coughs> should cross correlate the response here message of XA due to sources large earthquakes all around the globe. You should cross correlate that with the response at again another receiver XP due to the same sources. But from this response, the sort of free surface multiples so are to be removed first. So do as if this station was recording in an Earth without free surface. If you do that, you obtain a response as if there was a source in XA in receiver XP. And moreover, you get also a similar response but then without free surface multiples. But in reality, you never going to have earthquakes near the, near the place where you put the receivers. Otherwise, you will need to apply seismic field from it. And in that case, you leave out those positions from integration. In that case, you can still find the response, but then only the response between XA and XB for the actual Earth, it's not for the Earth without free surface. Uh, we tested the relation numerically, and then um, we tried to retrieve reflections between XA and XB for varying XB, which varied XB such that in the end it puts the whole cloud. Then this shows a reconstructed response in comparison with the directly modeled screen functions. And uh, you can see that they are pretty much similar. So that relation is really working, at least if you've got the earth analysis. Also, if you re remove many of the earthquakes, then in the input, and then apply it again for all the different station positions, then still many many events can be retrieved as well, but of course you're not going to get everything. So this is work from many years ago and it's quite exciting to see that uh, in, the, in the last few months a few <laughs> papers appeared where they're actually applying similar things. First of all the paper from Nishida where he used <coughs> up to nine years of data from a whole collection of stations all around the club. He looks specifically in frequency bands, uh, in this frequency band, which is just below the uh, single frequency microstancing. He removed all the large earthquakes from the data, and thus the only thing he was got left with to cross correlate in the end was the seismic hum, so and effectively oceanic sources. Then Using this data, he cross collated all possible station pairs and then stacked over a common offset. And what he obtained are those responses for the transverse and transverse combination, radial, radial, vertical, vertical. In comparison with the actual Green's functions here below, and you see that quite a bit of it is actually being reconstructed by then in the end just using the, the seismic hum. You see clearly the direct P wave, direct S wave, etc. Another paper recently appeared from uh, Linden et al., which applied a similar process to US ray data only. Um, a big difference, though, is that they did not remove the big earthquakes, but they only 
they only downgraded the earthquake responses to a level, to an amplitude level similar to the background noise. And so far, they used only the, the vertical component. But otherwise, they also uh, post correlated its possible station fans and then stacked it over common offset things. And what they obtain does, it's also fairly spectacular. Uh, this is the response they obtain as function of offset. And this is then the directly modeled uh, uh, Queen's functions. I see that besides the, the, the radio waves, they clearly find the reflections from the core mental boundary. And also, they find a reflection all the way from the other side of the of the globe. A <coughs> small disadvantage here is still that these uh, this data cannot directly be used for imaging, or it could be used, but then then it uh, gives only uh, a very low lateral resolution. The reason is that uh, those are average reflections over the whole of the user array. There is still one alternative uh, informatory implementation that could be considered to get to get more localized reflections. In this case, using only one one source. With this uh, method, it's called received uh, seismic informatory. The integration is not over sources because there's only one source that so cannot be known, but it's over receivers, or more specifically, also receiver pairs. And with this method, so you can take out one reflection, one stationary reflection for a certain virtual source and virtual receiver. We, we tested this also on use ray data, where we used an earthquake in Mexico, and those are the stations that all measured this, this earthquake. From all the stations, we selected a blend of stations which is more or less in line with the with the earthquake, at least if you choose a certain estimate. And this cross section here is showing that these kind of reverberations they could exist within the array. And if they exist, they can be used really to pick out these kind of primary reflection paths. So we checked the data and we saw that these uh, reverberation, so the reflection with the core mental boundary and its multiples, they are very present in the data. So we went on and applied receiver pair seismic informatory, and then indeed you can find SES reflection and multiples and higher order multiples. If you then look in detail to the event in the correlation panel, you can find out where it reaches a maximum. And that gives you the information where you obtained the virtual source and where the virtual receiver. All right. So far for today, I'll move on to a small wrapping up of what we discussed. We have seen that the user array has been designed excellently to image the mental. However, there is uh, there is a lack of sources to do this uh, directly with seismic reflection imaging. One possible solution is then to apply a body rate of seismic interferometry to distant seismicity and to create virtual sources within the array. We discussed that you can indeed do that, uh, that you can retrieve lithospheric scale reflections using distant seismicity. Only for the use array, the station spacing was too large, at least for the transportable component. Then we discussed that you can receive also zero offset reflection responses. And there is no reason why this would not work for the use array data. So in principle, you could obtain a zero offset reflection response between or below each use array station and use that to image the crust locally and uh, but in the end, because of the large station spacing, it's, it's more suitable for imaging the mental or the mental transition zone. <laughs> also, I've shown that seismic conformity can be applied on a global scale. 
uh, to show that in the meantime uh, the first successful applications appeared in the literature and we discussed a small alternative where it's possible to integrate over receiver pairs instead of over sources and then pick out these kind of stationary travel paths that would give a more localized uh, reflection. Oh, that's for now. I hope uh, I was still online. Uh, say, like the last 10 minutes, some strange things appeared, but uh, well. Uh, you, uh, you're still there, Elmer. Thanks a lot. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was that was really interesting. Um, it's a really unique way to look at data that I've never never really had any experience with. Um, I had a question about. Uh, you were mentioning how US array isn't ideally spaced to look at um, uh, reflections close to the station. At what at sort of what sort of array spacing does that become available? Um, so, so that's, that's this kind of uh, example. Right. In fact, in fact, uh, to to retrieve those zero offset reflections. So, mm -hmm. Where you put a virtual source at the same stage as your receiving, it's really a uh, until that stage it's a one-station method. So the the station spacing in your array uh, does not matter at all for retrieving reflections. However, if you want to start using those reflections for building an image, then for yeah, so if you want to put those reflections. Still in a migration algorithm, where you use then uh, also all the reflections obtained from the neighboring from the neighboring uh, uh, stations. In the end, to uh, what is it? To make sure that all the reflections have all the, become localized. Uh, to to achieve that, then you would still need to have a relatively dense station spacing, but the uh, station spacing needs becomes less if you only focus on deep interfaces. So for the crust, the station spacing will be too low, but for the uh, interfaces in the mental transition zone, that would be very fine. And certainly for regions near the core mental boundary, it would be uh, excellent. Okay, great. Uh, so I think there's some questions coming in. Uh, let's see. Okay, uh, there's a, a question from Derek Shutt. And actually, before I start going through questions, uh, there were already several talks uh, thanking you for giving such a fascinating, um, fascinating talk. So um, from Derek Shutt, he asks, uh, would it be possible to get T star variations with multiple SCS reverberations. Um, I must admit, I'm not sure what T star variations are. I think that's a uh, attenuation parameter, looking at um, how attenuation changes with frequency. Um, um, that, that could that could be really diff be difficult. At least when you apply it, uh, when you apply straightforward uh, seismic interferometry, then those correlation integrals they assume no losses, and the losses which are there in reality they are they are not correctly treated. So from the response you obtain. Um, Using just standard interferometry, like I explained today, then uh, the uh, <coughs> so the Q information or the loss information, which is in the retrieved response, that one is not accurate anymore. So a, a direct implement implementation uh, would not work, I'm afraid. But there are alternatives that are possible. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Casper Van Wyck, and Casper uh, is curious, where are the Mediterranean noise sources to get a multi-offset recovery? Um, 
Yeah, that's, that's a good question. If, if you look to the Mediterranean, it's it's not extremely huge, and you have you need to have sources at different distances to obtain illumination with different angles of incidence. And so the beamforming there it showed that we had really those different angles of incidence, but it's true you can only uh, can only uh, explain that that there are, should still be sources also outside the Mediterranean. So apparently it's not the Mediterranean only, but there's also still sources in the northern Atlantic that uh, contributed to P-waves arriving there in uh, Egypt. Okay, uh, there's a question from Christelle uh, Wouth here. And uh, Christelle is curious about uh, what are the applications in volcanology? Would you be able to image a, a magma reservoir or a conduit with these sort of techniques? Um, yeah, yeah, in principle, yes. It's um, yeah. So what we've discussed now is mostly applications where you use distant seismicity and uh, with those long travel paths of the distant seismicity, it loses all the higher frequencies. So if you would use that, then it's it will be quite hard to image structure in detail close to the close to the Earth surface. And anyway, if you would like to do that, it's it's important to to have a really uh, high density network. And in that case, then you can use a mix of both distant seismicity and local seismicity. In case this uh, this is the uh, magma movement or uh, anything happening there creates seismicity, you can also use the local seismicity and a combination of local and distant seismicity. Uh, could in the end of the application of seismic informatory gives you reflections at different scales, which can then in the end be combined to a quite detailed model of the volcano. The re reason why you need a very dense network is that in the volcano you, you expect many interfaces not to be really horizontal, but more deviated or very complicated even. And to capture all reflections of those complicated interfaces as well, you simply need a very, uh, very large sampling of uh, receivers. OK, great. Um, so I had another, uh, another question about um, looking at using a temporary array for, for this sort of process. How long would you need to have some of your stations out to capture enough events, just in sort of your experience, to um, employ some of these methods? Yeah, uh, that's a good question or a very relevant question. Um, I think I'm not sure anymore how long the this Verme array was out. I think it was around four or five months of data. But because it was aligned with the Ring of Fire, uh, even those months to visit sufficed to find uh, enough earthquakes to find, to fill up this required uh, illumination range. So it, it depends a bit on the orientation of the array, for sure. And just to obtain those um, zero offset reflections, yeah. If you at, at if at the other side of the globe there is a seismic zone that's really active, like for the high climb array, there was uh, a zone in the Andes, then also again only a few months of data would suffice. But if at the other side of the globe is then like only the Indian Ocean, for instance, and not any of the subduction zones, then probably if you only have earthquakes at mid oceanic rifts, then probably would need like two years of data before you have enough signal to noise. OK, great. Uh, there's a question from uh, Victor Avila. And he's curious, uh, for examples for basin studies, is there any one in particular that you could recommend? 
Um, I listed some. I'll bring up the slides. I put some references from there in the introduction. Um, yeah, by, by my knowledge, the, yeah, the, yeah, well, uh, in the Dragano for all in 2006, it's all, all shown numerically for a uh, for a basin scale, and it basically shows how to implement the uh, how to implement the relation from Wappen and from Clairbaus, and also from Houston. And in his following papers, you see the first successful applications to real data. So I, I think myself, I would start with the 2006 paper that really explains how to implement it. And then afterwards, I think the last few years, uh, there are uh, quite a number of successful applications to real data. The, the last one I've seen is by chance from a volcano setting from uh, Chaput at all. But uh, there might be more. Okay, great. Um, another question from Christelle. Uh, she's curious, do you know if the technique has any potential applicability to looking at the lithospheric structure under East Africa's rift system? Um, and then she just adds in, based on either some of the existing data sets in that area or um, for, you know, possibly Africa Array, which is currently deployed there. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. I, I think, uh, yeah, I th in general, it can be applied to to uh, arrays all the world, especially. Uh, I'll bring up the slides again. Well, sorry for the delay. I just explained it. So to, to retrieve those zero offsets, the flexion responses, in fact, you, you can, apply, it can apply for almost any station of the globe, because then the range of seismicity you can you can choose from, kind of. Uh, maybe it's nice to show. Still. Yeah. So here I showed the zone of seismicity you could choose from for the used array, but if you have a station in Africa, then uh, this zone of seismicity would just shift to a different area. But this, the zone of seismicity is this large that, in fact, for almost any station on the globe, is likely to work. And probably in Egypt, also in uh, Africa, you can measure with quite. I'm not sure, but I assume you can get relatively good data because uh, there might be uh, towns, etc., which are not too close. <coughs> anyway, that's not relevant. So uh, one thing is that you can almost always uh, retrieve the zero offset re reflection responses using this uh, global phase seismic interferometry. The other thing is, like we showed in the study in Egypt, that we could use the micro seismics from the Mediterranean and then possibly also partly from the Northern Sea. And it's quite likely if if you measure at other places, which are more inside the continents, that a big part of the micro which you measure are in fact body waves. And if you measure really close to PCCs like uh, East Coast US or actually East Coast US, West Coast or Europe, then what you mostly measure in those micro are just a complete domination of uh, surface waves. So more into the interior of Africa, there's also a scope for using micro as a source for the input for seismic interferometry. OK. Uh, there's a question from uh, Wiesen Chen. And uh, Wiesen is asking, uh, he was pointing out, you applied seismic interferometry in southern Tibet, where you can trace the lithospheric structure uh, with the discontinuities. 
Uh, his question is, what is the advantage or disadvantage uh, over using receiver functions to do that? Uh, and then he uh, adds in, I noticed that there were um, some reverberations in your result. Um, I think the main advantage is that uh, we use, here we use, uh, uh, for obtaining the reflectivity image, use illumination in the end, which is almost from right below. So what we retrieve are those uh, reflections um, yeah, at, at zero offsets. So you could say from the Earth's surface, you, uh, you're looking right below to the subsurface. And with receiver function, you're always looking a bit to the size. You're using teleseismic arrivals for which there are large angles of incidence, which you get clear uh, conversion from P2S or from S2P. And those large angles of incidence uh, or from events from the conversions you obtain at your surface, those are much harder to really localize to the correct uh, location in the subsurface. Things that come from right below, or from almost right below, that's a lot easier to do. So the post-processing, so the further imaging of the, the the data quantity, in this case reflections with respect to conversions, for those reflections it's a lot easier. The other thing is that the time difference between conversions is quite small and it's larger for reflections. So in theory, for the reflections you can then uh, a higher resolution as well. But you, need to story, you need to make sure that, uh, uh, that you sufficiently stack out the spurious events. And yeah, so <laughs> with, I think with all methods, you need to be careful in the end to look to real reflectivity or real convertibility and not some kind of side effects. OK. I uh, just wanted to make sure in the audience if there were if there are no other questions out there, uh, I think I'm at the end of the submitted questions so far. Uh, there was just one, one more comment from you uh, or for you, Elmer. I guess uh, San Zong Zhang uh, said that he that you recently uh, or, or that he was thanking you for your presentation. So um, from a group that I think you visited in Saudi Arabia. So I'm interpreting his note right. So. <laughs> Okay, yeah. uh, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if there are no other questions out there, I'll, wait, uh, I'll just hang for one second, make sure there's nobody's frantically typing anything in. Um, but yeah, uh, I just want to say uh, thanks again, Elmer. Uh, it was a great, great talk. I, there were a bunch of comments from people who said it was fascinating, and they used that word specifically. So I think you gave everybody a lot to think about. Okay, yeah, that's great. Uh, I'm uh, happy to hear that uh, quite some people attended it. I hope it was not uh, too fast, and if it was, uh, please uh, write me an email for more explanation, or I can refer to you to the, to the right uh, references. Yeah, no, I, I think it was I think it was great. It was really interesting, and uh, it'll be uh, I'm going to finish the recording in a second, and it will be uploaded I think by the end of the week to our website for. Um, everyone to refer to. So, um, well, again, thanks a lot, Elmer. Uh, really appreciated it, and especially since it's getting late into the night in Europe. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, thanks again. Yep. Thanks, too, and happy Easter break, you all. Yep, take care. <laughs>